According to the Holy Bible, Abraham entertained three angels. When they later visited the city of Sodom, they were believed to be normal earthmen. When the Israelites left Egypt, an angel appeared as a pillar of fire and guided them to the mountain of Horeb. The prophet Elias ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot. Ezekiel described the apparition of a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. In its mist, like the color of amber, also from within it came four living creatures. They had the likeness of a man. St. Paul reminded the Hebrews that some have unwittingly entertained angels. There is one instance which is echoed in the Bible, which is the story of Enoch uh, being taken up to heaven to be with the gods. In the Bible, uh, the statement is very brief about it. There's much more about it in the so-called books of Enoch, of which we have two versions that describe the voyage, actually two voyages. Uh, one time he came back to earth, another time he was taken uh, to be with the divine beings. And um, this is really a, a version of uh, a Sumerian tale, uh, in this particular case, of a uh, person called Enme Duranki, which uh, is a title given to him after the abduction or visitation, uh, which means uh, the master, the master of the bond between heaven and earth. And it specifically says that, among other things, he was uh, taught the secrets of mathematics, the secrets of the calendar, and the secrets of the movements of the planets. It is said about Imhotep, the inventor of the hieroglyphs and architect of the first pyramid of Egypt, that he was a student of the watchers who came down to earth in their celestial boats. Further references to these cosmic messengers are offered in the Vedas, the sacred scriptures of ancient India, which belong to the oldest written records in the history of mankind. Uh, according to the Vedic literature, there are many different uh, types of human-like beings living within the universe, and they're all descended from an original common ancestor. Uh, according to the Vedic writings, there has been uh, communication between uh, human beings and other uh, types of human-like beings in, throughout the universe uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, this used to be, in fact, more common than it is now. Uh, according to the Vedic literature, we're now in a period called the Kali Yuga, in which communication between humans and higher uh, forms of life is somewhat curtailed. So actually the idea is that uh, this communication was much more uh, extensive in the distant past. Why did these contacts take place? Well, there's uh, the ultimate question of purpose boils down to the question of what is the ultimate purpose of life? Why did this universe come into being in the first place? Uh, the basic concept that you have in the Vedic literature, uh, starting in the middle, basically, of the explanation, is that you have uh, living beings who have uh, spirit souls, the soul is the essence of the being, uh, who are in a state of ignorance. These living beings are situated in bodies made of the material elements. And because of these material bodies, they don't understand the true nature of the self. So there's an evolutionary process whereby, through experience in the material world, in different material bodies, one can gradually elevate one's consciousness. So life on Earth also is a school, so to speak, in which uh, living beings take bodies of uh, human form on the Earth to undergo certain experiences which in due course will elevate their uh, consciousness. So the purpose of communication from higher beings in the universe is to aid in this process, to give people instructions which will ultimately enable them to attain to a higher platform of consciousness. So the idea is that on the earth, uh, people are basically living in a state of ignorance, uh, but from time to time, beings from the uh, higher uh, systems within the universe will come down to the earth and transmit uh, spiritual knowledge to the people here on the earth. So in this way, you have different religions uh, developing. Of course, that's a very complex process because 
once knowledge is transmitted to this earth, then people begin to do things with that knowledge. And so you can have the development of different uh, religious uh, creeds and so on and so forth. In 1952, Lord Desmond Leslie, a celebrated fighter pilot of World War II, nephew of Sir Winston Churchill and scion of the oldest Irish nobility, wrote the first book about these obvious parallels between modern-day UFO sightings and descriptions in those ancient Indo-Vedic writings. I was in a friend's library, and we were waiting. There was nothing to do, so I just suddenly saw this book. Or rather, it seemed to jump out of the shelf at me. Atlantis and Lemuria, written in 1890 by Scott Elliot, published by the Theosophists, with maps of Atlantis and descriptions, and all taken from the astral of the Akashic Record. And it was very exciting. The thing that interested me most was the description of their flying machines, which it said was circular, and glowed in the dark and could move very quickly on this free energy. And they were called Vimanas. And that got me going. I said, now wait a minute, these sound so like these flying saucers we had just heard about. Remember Captain, um, was it Mantella? Rupert Mantella chap who first saw them and described them like flying saucers. So I decided I'd do a bit of research. And I went to the British Museum Library, especially the Oriental section, where um, I got out the, the whole of the Mahabharata. Lovely English literal translation by Protap Chandra Roy. No florid, just straight literal. And each chapter luckily had a summary. You know, there were about 20 volumes, and I waded through and picked out everything about these Vamanas. And I just couldn't believe it, that the ancients had had them, and that they'd been in contact with space people. And it said, by means of these wonderful craft, the star people can visit Earth, and we can visit the stars. And then it described them in Tibet, as like pearls in the sky. <laughs> you couldn't have had... But then I read on, and there was things about wars in ancient India, and some of the weaponry they used with able to make three-dimensional images of a false army. Hologram, surely. A thing called the Brahma weapon, which had the power of the universe, and a light of a thousand suns, which Teller then quoted, you remember, about the atom bomb. And it said um, that um, the survivors rushed and bathed and threw off their arms, but a few days later their hair fell out, their skin turned red, and they died of a horrible sickness. And the army was so burned they were just like even the elephants were shadows on the ground well, that was Hiroshima surely <laughs> so I said you know all this has happened before whether it was a space war or war among the Atlanteans I don't know for one entire year Lord Desmond searched in old libraries for references to ancient UFOs then he completed his book and then I got from a correspondent in America, um, Williams, Rick Williamson, who said a friend of his had had a contact, a landing, and taken these amazing photographs. So I wrote to him and said I'd written this book, and could I see his photos? Well, back they all came with a lovely letter, giving me permission to use them. Mm. Nothing about any payment or anything like that. These astonishing pictures of Adamskis, which were quite unlike what we thought a UFO should look like. And we had them tested for um, atmospheric hazing and recession and all, and it came out that they were large objects, quite a long way away, and not little models close up. <laughs> 